world languages are complicated and annoying. Penante complene au communicadi penecanate lingvo estus fustre ma facile. Cacci tue video ne veloz vingon tempon ca penon sige estus in sensensa la vingo. It's alienating, right? A language barrier can be a greater divide than any physical border. If you grow up without the ability to communicate with people, you think of them as different, and this can lead to problems. One man decided to create a language that everybody could get behind. He would create a language without the headaches of a country. Esperanto. Treaties, rivalries, borders, history, religion, politics, flags, anthems. No thank you. Actually. L. L. Zamenhof was a man who loved language. Speaking Russian, German, French, Polish, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, he wrote a five act classical tragedy in Russian when he was 10. A Jew from Bialystok, Poland, then Russia, he was surrounded by a mixture of languages and isolated communities. I was taught that all people were brothers. While outside in the street at every step, I felt there were no people. Only Russians, Germans, Poles, Jews and so on. This was always a great torment to my infant mind. So I often said to myself that when I grew up, I would certainly destroy this evil. He envisaged a world where everybody spoke two languages, their native tongue and Esperanto. It would be an easy to learn, universal second language, completely neutral, with no country, politics or pride associated with it. It could be the language of government, science, commerce, international understanding and peace. Anyone from any country would be able to communicate with anyone from any other. And once we all understood everybody, human empathy would do the rest. Zamenhof's dream may seem woefully optimistic today, but this was 1880. Globalization was still a speck on the horizon. He was working as an optometrist in Warsaw, giving free eye care to the poor. He spent his evenings, however, creating a language so easy as to make its acquisition mere play to the learner. The alphabet has one letter per sound, so word pronunciation should always be consistent. Words are built using a basic root word, prefixes and suffixes, with the ending of the word indicating the class. Noun, adjective, infinitive, adverbs, object, plural, past, future, conditional, command. So you can take a root word, say san, meaning health related, add the noun class and you have sanno, meaning health. Add the adjective class and you have sanna, healthy. Add the prefix mal, meaning opposite, and you have malsanna, ill or sick. Squeeze in the suffix ul to indicate a person, and you get malsonulo, a sick person or patient. Add another suffix a, meaning place, and you have malsonaleo, a place for a not healthy person, or a hospital. By learning just 3,000 root words, you can create another 20,000, the amount of words known by most native English speakers. Conversely, if you learn a new word, say vendisto, a salesperson, you can work backwards to vendeo, a shop, and vendi, to sell. There's only one definite article, the accent always falls on the penultimate syllable in a word, and all of the grammar and word formations follow strict but easy rules. If you're unsure of a word in Esperanto, your guess is likely correct. Most studies report that Esperanto is somewhere between 5 to 15 times quicker to learn than most European languages. Plus, if you already speak one, you've got a nice head start, as most Esperanto root words have Romance or Germanic origins. In 1887, Zamenhof launched his international language, under the pseudonym Dr. Esperanto, or Dr. Hopeful. He began publishing a periodical called the Esperantisto, where speakers could find each other and read his translations of Charles Dickens. In 1895, an article called Judgment or Faith caused the Esperantisto to be banned in Russia, home to the majority of its readers. The Esperanto fanboy, Leo Tolstoy, had to personally intervene to get the ban lifted. The language continued to spread though, and Zamenhof now had friends and influence. In 1905, the first Universal Congress of Esperanto took place in France. Zamenhof took to the stage to speak publicly about his Esperanto philosophy. For the first time in human history, we, citizens of the most diverse nations, stand side by side, not as strangers, not as competitors, but as brothers. 
Two, understanding each other without forcing our own languages on each other. Do not regard each other with suspicion because ignorance divides us, but love each other and shake hands, not in the insincere manner of one foreigner to another, but sincerely, as human to human. After the conference, Esperanto exploded across Europe and was almost adopted as the official language of the League of Nations, being vetoed by only one country. But Zamenhof had turned his attention to his next project, Hamaranism, literally humanitivism. He was a keen political Zionist in his youth and this acted as the seed of his plans, but they were to change over time to not just include the Hebrew religion, but all and any religions or people. He believed in uniting the world into a place where a country's language, religion and people would always remain separate from national interests and the state. But this was 1914 and he foresaw that the borders of Europe would be redrawn after the war. He contacted every country to ensure that in the peace conferences that were to inevitably follow, then stated the law, each sovereign state shall belong morally and materially to all its natural and naturalised inhabitants, regardless of their language, religion or supposed origin. No ethnic group in the state shall have a greater or lesser right than other groups. All citizens shall have the full right to use whatever language or dialect and to practise whatever religion they please but a nationalism unlike anything the world had ever seen was erupting around him. He felt the importance of his cause greater than ever, yet his influence was at its lowest as Europe was gripped once again by anti-Semitism. If I had not been a Jew from the ghetto, the idea of uniting humanity either would never have entered my head or it would never have gripped me so tenaciously throughout my entire life. No one can feel more strongly than a ghetto Jew the sadness of dissension among peoples. My Jewishness is the main reason why, from my earliest childhood, I gave myself wholly to one overarching idea and dream, that of bringing together, in brotherhood, all of humanity. That idea is the vital element and the purpose of my whole life. The Esperanto project is merely a part of that idea. I am constantly thinking and dreaming about the rest. But him being Jewish made Esperanto political, and he battled to try and distance himself from the movement because of it. Hitler would go on to accuse Esperanto in Mein Kampf as being part of the Jewish conspiracy, and in 1940 a Nazi report stated, The universal language invented by him, Esperanto, which through the same reading material for people of all races, colours and geographical origins, through the same education, ideals, beliefs and goals, was to lead gradually to a general racial stew. To consider Esperanto as just an auxiliary language for international communication is wrong. The artificial language Esperanto is part of Esperantism, the weapon of the Jews. Esperanto speakers of any background were subjected to and killed in concentration camps throughout Europe. And due to the advocacy of international communication, Esperantists would also be killed in Stalin's purges. Despite the Nazis' best efforts, prisoners were still able to teach each other Esperanto, the guards believing it was Italian. Esperanto was able to survive and continue to spread after the Second World War, when humanity looked hopefully towards peace. Today, Esperanto has an estimated 2 million speakers worldwide. It's the 32nd language with the most Wikipedia articles, more than Greek, and it has gradually seeped into popular culture. Can the Esperanto Society be far behind? I mean... Sulla Esperanto Societo Esti Multe Malantau? Ident details SSS Esperanto Ocean Seeding Ship. Some films have even been made nee. in Esperanto. Yes, that is William Shatner. Esperanto was included on the Voyager 1 message, and it even has an island named after it. It wasn't the first or last artificial language, but it is the biggest. So why did it fail? This is a complex and nuanced discussion, but if it had to be summed up in one word, English. America's economic dominance after World War II, the rise of Hollywood and imperialism meant Esperanto never really had a chance in government, media or trade. But even if the universal language of the future isn't Esperanto, it still has an important place in education. Remember the hours in school you spent learning the recorder? That wasn't so you could become the world's greatest... recordist? It was because we don't teach music to children with a complicated instrument. We start them with a recorder to demonstrate how music works, even if they never play it again. It acts as the foundation to piano, guitar and the French horn. 
Similarly, Esperanto demonstrates how language works, even if they never speak it again. It acts as the foundation to Spanish, Russian and French. You wouldn't teach someone the organ if they didn't know the difference between notes and chords, so why do we try to learn Spanish without knowing our infinitives from our participles? The educational value of Esperanto has been widely investigated, albeit with a heavy European bias. But if a child spends two years learning Esperanto, and then three years learning a foreign language, they will have a higher competency in that foreign language than a child who studied it for five straight years. If we're going to teach foreign languages in school, we should do it early and do it properly. If you'd like to learn Esperanto, Learnu.net is an excellent place to start. Yes, Zamenhof would be disappointed by Esperanto's progress today, but Dr. Hopeful would be devastated by the barriers and hostilities that remain between us. He died of a heart attack as Europe and humanity fell to pieces during the First World War, and thankfully didn't live to see Esperantists and his own children systematically slaughtered during the Second. It's sad that a man who so willingly dedicated his life to humanity should have his work destroyed by it. If Nobel Prizes were awarded for effort, Ludwig Lischer Zamenhof deserved one. This video was brought to you by no one, because I currently have zero subscribers.